Uh, so I think we'll move towards making a start. So to, to, to let you all know, um, this is a meeting of the Faculty for Homeless and Inclusion Health, to which everybody is, uh, is welcome, but if you're expecting something else, you've, you, you, you've ended up in the wrong place. Uh, we've basically got two speakers. We've got uh, Amina Verity, who's going to be telling us about some research she's been doing into access to uh, uh, healthcare for excluded groups. Now, Alex Bax, who's the Chief Executive of Pathway Charity, um, will be speaking uh, about the future of the faculty and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and our, our plans for the future and, and the relationship to, between faculty and, and Pathway. Uh, a reminder, everybody just joining, do introduce yourselves on the chat room and, and please leave your speakers on, on mute. Um, so I'm going to go over to mute now and let Amina uh, introduce herself and, uh, and take it away. I've got myself. Brilliant. Thanks very much, um, Nigel. Can everyone? Yeah, I'm not on mute and you can all see the screen. Yeah, brilliant. So um, my name is Amina. I'm a GP at Amersham Vale Training Practice in Lewisham and in London, and I'm a quite a new Pathway Fellow. Um, and I did a three month pilot study looking into um, how the changes in general practice have affected um, vulnerable groups. So the question that I looked at was, does total triage and remote by default consulting disproportionately impact vulnerable groups? So why, for those of us who work in primary care, in April 2020, we received a letter from NHS England asking all practices to move immediately to total tri digital triage wherever possible and um, remote management wherever possible and appropriate. Um, so there was not much more in that letter other than that, and there was quite little central guidance. Um, but GPs rose admirably to that. And uh, I think, you know, you can see from the numbers that actually that move did prevent general practice waiting rooms from becoming a hotbed of transmission and um, COVID wasn't spread in those settings because of that. Um, however, we, I was having lots of discussions with my colleagues and and having moved to that model, we were seeing a lack of appointments from kind of our usual complex, older and more vulnerable patients. Um, I work in an area of high deprivation, as I'm sure many of you working in inclusion health do. Um, but we also have a very um, young population and we're quite unique in that our practice sits in a very high area of deprivation, but we're also the practice for a university. Um, and so we were completely overwhelmed with e-consults from kind of the worried well um, which I don't know if other people found that, but we, we had a real deluge of kind of consults and, and really struggling to manage our time and wondering where our normal patients had gone and kind of actively reaching out to them. So uh, to kind of look into this further, I developed a methodology with um, a project supervisor. Um, some of you might know her, Victoria Tutsuri Brown. She's a GP working in Tower Hamlets and sits with the RCGP as well. Um, so we used four methods. It was a mixed method study. Um, we did interviews with key stakeholders providing support services to vulnerable patients and in the end I had 13 respondents and these were people from like Lewisham Refugee and Migrant Network and also um, you know other homeless health charities and the health inclusion services that work in the borough. And then also Healthwatch, um, who are a national charity, but the Lewisham branch were doing some feedback forums with patients, with BAME patients specifically, looking into their access to care around um, healthcare in general following the pandemic. So in collaboration with them, they added some questions about specifically about access to care under this new model for those patient groups, um, and then summarized the findings and sent them over to me, which I've included in the report. Um, we then did a survey, a, a Survey Monkey online survey to all the GP practices in Lewisham um, to try and understand how people had implemented um, these new policies. And then did a mystery shopper exercise of 10 practices in the primary care network of North Lewisham where my practice is based. Um, so this involved um, reviewing the access, the messaging, of the phone, the website, and the door, what was actually said on, written on the door of practices, and trying to register as a patient, um, saying that I had no internet access and no ID available by telephone and seeing what responses I got. 
I also try to do a quantitative assessment to try and ascertain the patterns of access to care between kind of vulnerable groups and non-vulnerable groups comparing to kind of a control. Um, it turned out to be a lot more complex than I thought it would be. <laughs> and if anyone's interested in a PhD, I'm sure there's a lot in there <laughs> that could be unpicked. I'm not going to talk about those results in detail because they basically didn't make much sense. And um, I'm not sure we got the right data out. Um, so we'll go into the qualitative results as a summary. So we saw basically a worsening of um, existing barriers. Um, so we know that vulnerable patients have um, a number of intrinsic factors that make it difficult for them to engage with healthcare at the best of times. And these barriers, such as poverty, language barriers, having chaotic lifestyles, mistrust of systems, all were made more difficult. Um, sorry, service providers felt that these um, intrinsic vulnerabilities would make navigating total triage and remote consulting more difficult. There were new barriers to access and the, one of the biggest ones was about the confusing messages and changes um, to services. So um, an interesting thing that Healthwatch found, which is now available publicly, was they did a survey of Lewisham residents and 20% of 1,300 respondents still did not know that their GP was open for routine appointments, which is really disheartening for all those who are working in general practice, doing all of that care. Um, and, but this kind of stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives had really confused people about where they could go for care and, and what they could do. The removal of the ability to walk in, so most practices close their doors in some fashion in order to, not most practices, some practices close their doors in some fashion in order to try and prevent um, the spread of COVID and to implement this triage system. And we know that patients with vulnerabilities tend to access care in a more unplanned manner. They need to be able to walk in and have an advocate help them navigate the system. Another theme that came out was patients, um, service providers felt that patients might be uncomfortable sharing information through triage, especially when this was shared with kind of non-clinical staff. And that was found in the Health Watch feedback forums as well, that the BAME patients that they spoke to said that they found it um, challenging and, and off-putting to have to talk to non-clinical staff about clinical problems. Um, this was made more worrying from those from vulnerable migrants who specifically worry about um, data sharing and, and that barrier of having to give information before you've spoken to a clinician was seen to be as a, as a significant barrier. Another thing that came up was deregistrations and moving to online registration. So many practices moved to online registration, which in, initially service providers felt, oh, this is great. We can just fill out a form. All of these come and bring your ID and come and show us your proof of address. That's all gone. But actually, they found that those barriers still existed and um, practices were often after the um, forms were sent, were then contacting to say, can the patient now scan their ID and send it? Or can they now post in their proof of address. So actually, in terms of the number of barriers that it created, if you didn't have an advocate to help you navigate that, you now have to find online access, fill out the form, then get your ID scanned and sent and sent, sent in. Um, and deregistrations were occurring in some places, not all, um, especially with the Everyone In campaign of some people being moved from borough to borough and then being found that suddenly they were out of service um, and finding it difficult to register with local practices where they'd moved. There was also this idea about remote consulting, finding it more difficult to build rapport and trust, and also the nature of remote consulting being not appropriate for this type of patient. So actually, um, when you have complex multi-morbid or chaotic um, lifestyles, a difficulty to prioritize your health, trying to explain what is wrong with you over the phone or by video console is a very difficult thing. And actually it kind of negates the whole two way system of like what we do as clinical, um, the, 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 old, the clinician agenda when we see patients, which is that if someone says to us, oh, I, I have a hurt, I've hurt my finger and they can come in and discuss that. But then you can say, oh, but look, you're cachectic or, you, you know, you've lost weight or you, you don't have any teeth. And, you know, maybe we should sort these things as well. And you can glad, gradually build that rapport and that many, many of the stakeholders felt that, you know, this would not work with their service users. 
And then digital exclusion was a big theme. So two types of digital exclusion. First, through um, people who find it difficult to navigate and use these digital services. And that can be for a number of reasons, but literacy, um, education. And then the other thing of how, um, of poverty. So digital exclusion through poverty. So these are like tech savvy young people who are perhaps asylum seekers or undocumented migrants who basically don't have the financial security to be able to pay for their data packages or phone credit in order to enable them to, to spend money on remote consulting. So just some illustrative quotes for you to see there. The Dots of the World Policy Officer giving an example of this um, service users that they had who had run out of um, credit on hold waiting for the GP. And actually that, that thing of when you're asking people to pay to access care just goes really against the, the whole concept of, of what we do in the NHS. Um, and even in, even in um, situations, so this was a service manager who runs a hostel, um, a homeless hostel in Lewisham, who they had a GP who was assigned to them. They have an in-reach service and they moved to remote consulting during the pandemic. And normally they would come every week, do face-to-face -face, um, consultations with the people who are staying in the hostel and basically found that um, when trying to do that remotely, it was basically very, very difficult, only five, six or seven successfully over a two and a half month period. So looking a bit more at qualitative results, we also asked about positives of um, this system and, you know, a lot of the clinicians felt that they had finally had better access in terms of more appointments because we know that that's been a crisis in general practice for a really long time and people struggling to, to actually get in to see their GP and suddenly actually doing remote consulting opened up the number of contacts. Um, it also allowed clinicians to be able to prioritise who they felt was really unwell and see them urgently on the day if they felt they needed to, because actually sometimes people can make a face-to-face 10-minute -face appointment to come in to ask for a repeat medication, and you've missed the opportunity to see someone who was having a heart attack sitting in the waiting room and didn't get an appointment because they weren't there in the queue. Um, those who, had act, who were acting as advocates for vulnerable patients felt that they had better access to primary care. So if you can navigate the system, actually turnaround times are much faster than they have been. Being able to drop off an e-consult online at any time of the day and then get a response from your practice in um, two working days has revolutionized kind of a lot of young people's lives. And also there was this other idea that people who find accessing mainstream services perhaps stigmatizing it actually reduce some of those barriers so actually if you can consult from wherever you are and you don't have to sit in a waiting room and have people judge you and your appearance and, and other things then maybe you'd be more likely to access care um, we talked about solutions as well with people and you know i'm going to go through those in a bit more detail um, but all qualitative um, interviews provide some really um, interesting and, and sensible, simple solutions that, that I'll talk through later. Um, so going to the GP survey, so we've got 27 responses um, representing 18 out of the 37 practices in Newisham. So not a massive sample size, but um, enough for us to try and understand a little bit about what practices were doing. 70% of the practices had moved to total triage during the pandemic. Um, which is quite interesting. So it, it was, you know, it was definitely in response to this because there are some practices that have been have been using these models for a while, but but in Lewisham anyway, the majority definitely were pushed to do this because of because of the pandemic. Um, majority were using kind of reception or clinician base, but one practice was using digital only triage, basically meaning that if you you have to go through their online app, and if you don't have access to that app, I don't know how you make an appointment or see anyone. Um, increased consultations per session compared to the normal 10 minute face to face sessions for a for a salaried GP. In one practice that was up to 31 to 35, um, which is a really unmanageable and worrying workload if you think about how long you're spending with each patient and with each clinical contact. 20% were using purely online triaging and 40% were using online only registration. So that meant that there was no way of doing registration other than online. And the triaging was going through um, online as well. 40% um, 
felt that continuity had reduced, 20% felt it had increased, but 22 out of 27 respondents were concerned about access for vulnerable groups. And the interesting thing just shows how, what significant variation there was between practices. And the majority of these practices are in a, a relatively small geographical area, you know, under one um, clinical commissioning group, um, but the way that they were implementing total triage and this remote by default consulting was, was wildly different, um, which again kind of highlights the lack of central guidance around this. So now talking about the mystery shopper, um, looking at messaging around total triage, only two of the practices had actually mentioned any change to their booking system and how um, things had changed since um, the pandemic. Um, but all of them were promoting their online methods, so you can you can access a doctor through patient access or the NHS app or eConsult. Um, when looking at the door message, none had any information in a different language. And again, this is a difficult thing because how do you decide which language? Um, but it's just something to be aware of. But seven out of ten mentioned stop or do not enter. And these are some photos of some of the signs that you can see. And I don't know, you know, obviously it's an interpretation, but I feel that that is not a welcoming sign. And if you're someone who doesn't speak English or perhaps vulnerable, that might make you think that your practice is closed. Um, when looking at the phone message, seven out of the 10 practices had actually mentioned that we are changing the way we're seeing patients. And they mentioned the triage first model and pointed people to book online first. Looking at online services, all practices had a method of online booking um, and seven out of 10 had an online consulting method. So there's two differences there. So online booking is basically you don't need to put in any information about your thing. You just request an appointment with a nurse or a doctor and an online consulting method is where you have to, it's a form of triage. So you have to fill out some questions about your problem and there is some intrinsic triage to that. So if you say, whilst you're filling out that form they have a lot of um safety netting where basically if you say i have central crushing chest pain it tells you to stop the form and call 999. um looking at the ability to walk in so four out of ten of the practices the door was locked three out of four of them you could enter by ringing the doorbell the intercom or speaking or knocking and then speaking to a receptionist but the information to tell you to do that was all in english in writing kind of on the door um, one you had to phone the practice so if you were someone who didn't have a phone you can't get into that practice you can't access that practice anymore um, however six out of the ten had the door open no barrier to walk into practice and have a physical conversation with the receptionist face to face when looking at registration information on websites um, online registration was was there however three out of ten of the practices said on their website that proof of ID was needed to register, which again is a really worrying finding given it just shows a, a, a lack of understanding about the NHS contract and, and, and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then when I did the registration attempt, which obviously has some flaws, I have a British accent, um, <clears throat> and um, but four, even with that, <laughs> four out of 10 of the practices refused to register me when I said I couldn't go online and I didn't have ID. One said they would check with the doctors and get back to me. And four of them said it was absolutely fine. They found an alternative method for me to come down to the practice and fill out the form and they would help me do that. Um, so in conclusion, there were concerns from those working with vulnerable groups, patients themselves and GPs working in Lewisham about how this change in model is affecting vulnerable things. There's corroboration of these concerns when you look at how practices have implemented these policies. And I just wanted to quickly mention about proportionate universalism and that it's really important that when we make service change, and obviously this service change had to happen rapidly, it was in response to, to a crisis. And normally you would hope that there would be kind of centralised impact assessments, but that we should make sure that in order to make sure everyone has access, um, in, in, to, in order to make sure that everyone is protected, everyone has to have access. And it's really important that we put extra effort into making sure that those who are vulnerable are, are, um, have, have the ability to navigate the system. And I'm going to move on to talk about some easy solutions that could be implemented. So these are the recommendations from this project. So 
Um, in addition to asking people to go and read um, the pathway reception guidance and the Dots of the World Safe Surgeries Toolkit and various and um, Groundswell's Listen Up Digital campaign, there's been lots of really good work on this as well. Um, but we said that providing a triage system which considers patients' disparities in access. So this is the concept that when a patient first contacts, that you have a method of recording that actually this patient will never be able to use eConsult and stop asking them to do it when they call and allow them to have a route in to be able to, to see um, GPs. Oh, did I just do that? Okay. Um, <laughs> Clear and consistent messaging. So this again is, is, there's lots of myths that I think unfortunately general practice is not putting out the right message. So we need to explain how our services under remote by default um, and total triage are working. We need to dispel myths that practices are not closed, that we don't do face-to-face -face appointments, which we do do, you just have to go through the triage system first and in informing people how to register and reassure about confidentiality to make sure people come back and consult with us. Um, reducing the length of time on call waiting, and I know this is a problem for practices across the country that you know the volume of calls has rapidly increased and trying to manage that, but then maybe if we can't reduce the length of time on waiting, then thinking about a free phone number or a callback service so that those who are on pay-as-you-go phones aren't disproportionately affected. Um, Working closely with um, patient advocates um, to ensure that those who are trying to help facilitate this, this care for people are not being told, oh, well, no, you're not the patient, we need to speak to someone else. And then thinking about if before that, the idea that someone who didn't speak English will come and speak to the receptionist and then try and make themselves understood through a lot of nonverbal communication, none of that can happen over the phone. So reception need to be empowered and trained to feel like it's okay for them to hang up the phone. I'm gonna call you back with an interpreter, what language, and then get the actual information to make sure that we're not losing people who just hang up and get frustrated. Um, Promoting continuity of care, face-to-face -face appointments, and being able to adjust your appointment length for vulnerable groups and patients with complex needs. So it's really important that under this model, everyone doesn't just filter into a seven-minute e-consult slot, and that we have the ability to bring in our complex patients for a walk-in face-to-face appointment in a COVID-secure way. Um, in order to do that, we need to think carefully about how we structure our triage systems and where patients can filter and how they can actually get into those appointments. And that will be different for every practice, but I think it's something that every practice needs to be thinking about. And then also maintaining outreach and in-reach primary care services, because right now, if we took any of those away, if we removed those things where we're, where we're actively reaching out, I think it would be catastrophic to, to groups who are, who are significantly vulnerable. And um, to finish, I presented this at our primary care network, the 10 practices who were part of the mystery shopper and just gave them some kind of clear, a bit more specific instructions about how, how we could do it. And they've actually been really receptive and we're, we're planning to read, reorder it in about four months time and we're going to work with them to try and improve our local access and messaging. One thing to think about is... Um, the Tollgate Medical Group based in northeast London in Tower Hamlets, they moved to this model about a year and a half, two years ago, and they actually do have some pathways for vulnerable patients and it shows and they've got quite a clear model of how how to do it. And I think it's not something that is un, insurmountable. It's just we have to think about the fact that we've moved to this without thinking about it. <laughs> and now we have to think about it and implement it. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me just, oh yeah, great, thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Amelia. That was absolutely fascinating. And, and actually a lot more encouraging than I thought it was going to be, um, because uh, you, know, the, you were starting to close the, uh, close the audit loop there by, by going back to practices and you're, and you're looking ahead to the, to the future. So that's really very encouraging. Um, and I think this is an area where, where often we, we in the, particularly those of us, uh, you know, working kind on of specialist services tend to feel a bit superior to mainstream practice. But I know anecdotally that people have had similar problems with, with practices, you know, that are specially commissioned for inclusion in health populations for whom you, you, you might think that there might be a different response. Um, so it's really helpful to have this challenge back. So just to say to everybody who uh, may have joined the meeting shortly after it started, um, if anybody's got any questions, we're very keen to hear from you, but if you would use the chat button at the bottom of, of the screen and put any questions in, in the chat, and then I'll, I'll relay, relay those to, to Amina. 
Um, so while you're having a think about that, um, when you said you went to the your, your practice group, I was thinking, good grief, you're going to get lynched. You know? So, and that really was been one of my first questions. I, I, I read the paper which you're, you're drafting to, to be published, and I, and I, and I, and I was really uh, impressed with that, but but also pleased to see that the message had been um, sort of softened a little bit because you know we know that in mainstream well in all of general practice everybody's feeling very beleaguered very stressed and the last thing they want is somebody else telling them that they're, <clears throat> that they're failing to, 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 to meet some standard that they didn't know about so have you got any thoughts about how we can land this message with with, with primary care so it becomes a, a positive encouragement rather than a perceived as a, as a, as a criticism yeah i think it's one of the things that um the supervisor that i've been working with um, was really keen on making sure that we didn't add to the barrage of GP bashing that's been going on in the mainstream media at the moment. Um, and I think one of the things is that unfortunately um, is that it comes down to, to very similar problems in general practice that we're often not given very good central guidance about what's expected. Um, and, and it's understandable what happened, you know, recently. Um, and in subsequent letters from the one in April, there were things like, oh, make sure you're looking after health inequalities, make sure you're thinking about vulnerable groups, but practically, what can you do? And I think that's what would be, um, I think that's what we think the, the, the usefulness of this project would be. So the, the plan is to, to hopefully replicate the study across a larger area and then um, get some create a toolkit of recommendations that we can easily give out to general practice that would be supportive and not punitive in any way because everyone I, and, and there are lots of good examples of, of, of practices that have been actively reaching out you know the amount of work that practices did reaching out to their shielded lists and all those sorts of things but I think again as it always is with inclusion health this group is it is hidden and unseen which is partly why the quantitative data didn't work um, how do you prove that a group of people who don't normally consult is consulting less? <laughs> um, and so I think it's about making people aware that this is a problem that we need to that we need to look at. And, and I was really surprised. I was very worried about doing the primary care network meeting, I'll be honest. Um, and it, they were everyone was really receptive really worried that that and they felt it everyone knew it people were feeling it themselves every day those informal discussions that led to us to do the project they were having the same ones like we are overwhelmed with this worried well right now all we are doing is nonsense rashes and fungal toes and all this kind of stuff and we're not actually seeing anyone who's sick and needs to be seen and um, so i think that's that's the kind of the key thing wow that, so that's that's actually very heartwarming, isn't it? That that you got such a positive response from your from your colleagues. Um, so I'm just looking at the the stuff in the, in the chat room. So for everybody's benefit, Sam's added the links to the the pathway GP registration guidance and the Docs of the World Safe Surgery Toolkit, which was which was mentioned. Um, and the the query about the the, the mystery shopping, I, I really would have thought that that would have people would have felt you were spying on them. So it's remarkable, really, that, that you managed to. Um, I mean it was what was said publicly. I don't know what was said privately <laughs> and how upset people were. Um, but, but overall, it was, it was a good response. And I think it's one of those things that actually my practice failed. And I've, been, I've implemented the Safe Surgeries Toolkit in my practice. And my, one of our receptionists asked for ID and said, I can't do it. And I was just like, I've had this conversation with you. And it's about actually it's very, very hard to make sure that the entire culture of your practice and everyone within it is adhering to that. And, mm -hmm. and the idea that individuals, because that's all it takes is one individual to have got the messaging wrong and that the priority was we need to protect from COVID and that's now overridden our normal practice. Um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, yeah, but, but, but this issue of, of GP registration just you know, has been going around for the last 20 years and we, we keep thinking we've... We fixed it, and you know we persuaded the CQC to include it in their inspections, and you know all of this the clear guidance has come out. But it, there's still a huge job to change the change the culture. So a, a couple of uh, a couple of other questions from from the chat room. Um, similar problems arising in dental practices. You know, we're, again a very, a very similar set of challenges. Um, and, and in that sector, a lot of the outreach has been suspended due to COVID risk. 
I guess, thinking about it, particularly if you're doing sort of, um, yeah, tools-based interventions like you do in dentistry, that, 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 does, that does get trickier. Um, what additional measure, measures are being put in place to, to reduce the, the outreach risk? Do, do you know the answer to that question or shall we? I think there's, there's lots of people who do, I can see yeah. and the other people who do outreach where it might be better for them to. Yeah, maybe I'll ask Sam Dorney Smith to have a think about that because I know she's there and I know she does outreach. We'll take a look at another couple of questions up and then we'll ask Sam to turn her microphone off, oh, off, oh, off mute. Uh, one question is about. I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah. I've had to jump onto my phone because both my children are now on drama sessions upstairs on my, um, <laughs> on my internet connection. So I'm struggling a little bit, but let me see if I can get back on the, on the laptop in a minute. <laughs> okay, fine. We'll, we'll 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 come back to you. Hey, the joys of Zoom is brilliant, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, we'll we'll come back to thinking about the about the outreach stuff. Um, so, a couple of couple of uh, good questions about the study. Did you look at gender at all? Um, and and then the other question from from Mo, our EBE lead, when assessing barriers to services, um, had you thought about using a lived experience person to to give you a different perspective? Is that something you thought about, Amina? Yeah, so I'll answer Mo's question first. So definitely the, the scope of this project was really, really tiny. It was basically me by myself for, for three months doing it with my supervisor. Um, and actually, it, we're very much calling it a pilot study. It doesn't have kind of a significant amount of, of power because it's just a, a few practices in a small area. It needs replicating. And one of the biggest things that we've realized is that we have to include EBE um, voices and making sure that, so when we, we've written a bid, hopefully, well, I don't know if that'll come off, but but hopefully we'll be able to do some more research later um, and ensure that, that that's at the forefront of it. And also the mystery shopper exercise should be an EBE person. Um, there's there's absolutely no reason why, why it shouldn't. And I think that would give a really different perspective and, and it's really important to, to look at. Um, when you say gender, do you mean in terms of uh, gender? I, I imagine that means, you know, about whether there was a different response to uh, you know, a, a, a woman or a man trying to uh, possibly in terms of perceived assertiveness or um, no no it was it was just me unfortunately yeah I imagine you're pretty assertive though aren't you so that's uh, that's probably a... <laughs> I, I tried not to be but yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another question about, about sharing the slides. I, I know this session is being recorded and, and, and that will be shared afterwards. Um, and would you be okay to, with having your, your slides set shared as well? Um, yeah, I'll just have to double check with, uh, with the project supervisor. But yeah, just, it's just because we're in the process of publishing the work. Yeah, and there's this whole thing about if we distribute the, anything written, then we could be... Um, accused of self plagiarization so i'll just have to right. double check okay it. well it, it, it might it might be that um there's to say that there's, there's there's 40 odd of us here so that that isn't going to worry but 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 maybe yeah. you know people getting people following through and, and, and looking at this um uh, presentation might, might be the might be the simplest thing um so i will we'll have to we'll have to we'll have to wrap up there's uh, uh kate from uh Groundswell reminding us of their my right to access healthcare cards uh, and there's an email address for, for, for people to, to get hold of those so that, that's really helpful. Sam are you, are you connected or shall we come back to you in a, in a minute? Nice view of your cat. Hello. I think maybe the answer there is no. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll see if we've got time to come back to, to Sam at the end. Uh, so thank you very much, Amina. Um, Sam, we'll come back to you in a, in, in a bit if that's okay. I'm going to get, I'm going to bring Alex in in, in now because the connection is still not great. Uh, so uh, Alex, are you out there somewhere? Can you turn your microphone off and mute? And yep, no, I'm here. Hi, hi guys. Um, thank you. Fascinating study. I hope colleagues can see why we were keen to share that with people because we think it's really important and very replicable work a very interesting kind of if, yeah if you could do it in in half of Lewisham or a third of Lewisham I guess it is then you can it must be if you can do things in Lewisham you can do them anywhere surely <laughs> um, so partly we hoped that might and I can see in the chat some encouragement to replication out there already but but and I think Olivia Butterworth from NHS England is on the call as well to to see whether we can try and 
use what you've done and build on it and kind of scale it a bit to see what's really happening. Um, so thank you for that. And we look forward to the publication. Fingers crossed. Um, I think what, what I wanted to talk to you, I'm going to do the same of trying to share my screen with you. I wanted to talk to colleagues about some changes which may be happening in relation to, to what pathway is and how we exist in the future. And then particularly to talk to you about the future of the faculty. So this is a faculty of homeless and inclusion health meeting and pathway hosts and created the faculty. And we're in an interesting period of phase of change, I think, in our existence. So I just wanted to, to share what's happening with you as a group and then invite you either in, in discussion to come back to me with thoughts, but also to say, do email or follow up what I say offline if, if something more longer occurs to you that you want to feed in. So I'm going to try and share my um, this little slide that I've just put together. So um, here we go. Can people see my slides? Is that OK? Um, what I want just to share with you, so, so Pathway was 10 years old this spring, and we had a lovely conference. Some people may remember that we timed it. We timed it carefully just to be at the very beginning of a global pandemic. It seemed to work out well. Um, and since then, a lot of time, effort been obviously absorbed by the response to coronavirus and COVID. But meanwhile, in the background, some of us have been in discussions with a charity called Crisis, which people will all have heard of. Um, and indeed, during this period, Crisis made a very formal proposal to Pathway to say that we would, how about we come much closer together? Um, and their formal proposal is that Crisis would become a member of Pathway, indeed our only, quote, member, which would give them ultimate control. They'd become like a 100% shareholder of Pathway. Um, they would want to keep Pathway's brand and our presentation, our independent board, our independent registration. So we would continue as we are to some extent, um, and we would continue to be self-governing, but we would be owned by Crisis. And in return for this, they would put some very significant investment into our operations. So we are in the middle of discussing this with them. Um, one of the reasons we, we opened these discussions is because the core funding we have from a, from a foundation called the Oak Foundation comes to an end um, in the middle of next year, effectively. And if we, if we don't do anything about that, we have some major financial challenges in about a year to 18 months. So we have to do something. Um, and Crisis are huge supporters of Pathways work, hugely value what we've done, hugely value the faculty. And so have been, we're now literally in the middle of to and fro negotiations about how the deal is in detail. We're partly saying, show us the money, and <laughs> how much? And they're kind of saying, how, what are the liaison arrangements for close working? At the heart of that, we've said that we will be producing a new five-year strategy. I'm sure everyone on the call has read Pathways fantastic. 2015 to 2020 strategic plan, which is no doubt your bedtime reading. Um, if you haven't, it's just like any strategic plan, it has a set of priorities and we're just refreshing it for crisis to say this is the plan which a new five-year plan from 2021 to 26 would define what we work on as a charity and would also lever their funding in to support the activity we've identified. So I've presented some of these objectives to a few colleagues on the call already. Our Pathway Fellows have had a bit of a sight of this, but I wanted to focus this afternoon on, on what we say around the faculty because Pathway continues to host the faculty and our amb ambition is with the support of crisis to, to make the faculty more, stronger, bigger, um, to do more. So um, I'll skip over that. If you can see this, so we, we've set out six strategic objectives for Pathway. I'm just going to hurry through them and get to the one about the faculty, but, but we, as part of this, we hope we'll be able to do more to roll out pathway teams and to build clinical a national inclusion health care quality network is a, is a great ambition, I think. Um, Amina's work comes in here. We want to find ways to support back, develop new intervention, intervention new models of care, um, and to increase our impact in terms of driving practical service change in the NHS. So that's another huge area of, of activity, which is stuff we've done already and we'll continue to do. Um, we see ourselves playing an ongoing role to stimulate, lead, fill research gaps, um, 
generate evidence and build partnerships across the health, wider health, social care and academic sector. Um, so there's a new one for us, we want to even more increase the weight of our voice and our collective impact on the system. So using the power of, of clinician voices, the power of research, the power of expert by experience voices to drive more change, to be more powerful in influence in the system. Um, and then the one I want to talk to you about was, this is our kind of corporate speak to support and develop the faculty of homeless and inclusion health as the independent voice and national network for inclusion health professionals, which is what we are doing this afternoon. Um, and that's the last, that's, uh, and then we have a corporate one. So just very quickly, those are our headline strategic aims. And underneath that, we have a set of objectives. I just wanted to share with people. These are in draft. It's what we've, some of them are what we've said before. Um, just pausing so you can read them. Um, and this is partly what we're attracting crisis to invest in, but I'm also very, very keen that you as members of the faculty think that these are the right things for the faculty to be focusing on. Um, so there are four here um, around standards, around a role which we've done to some extent, but could do loads more around influencing education and training, um, having some resource to just turn the faculty over and keep it running. Um, national influencing using the faculty as, as an influencing brand and then there's a second set of things um a particular focus on it says interprofessional here but i think we probably might extend that to say multidisciplinary and interprofessional learning um to keep the conference going to develop these networks with other medical royal colleges and um, some of you may have seen that we managed to help support crisis and, and generate a letter just recently um, signed by us, but also the RCGP, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Emergency Medicine, Royal, um, Royal College of Physicians, Society of Public Health, et cetera, et cetera. So again, our, the power of us mobilizing people around the cause of inclusion health is something crisis are very keen to support and to build on. We think it's a key thing the faculty has allowed us to achieve. We're keen to keep a membership scheme going because we think some skin in the game from everybody is helpful, but we'd also always want the faculty also to be open to anybody who has an interest in inclusion health, with money or without. Dot, 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 something to do with medical students, help me. <laughs> we, think, we think there's huge value in trying to get, get them while they're young, as it were. And we've done quite a bit as pathway and through the faculty to try and engage around medical curricula or to build training programs, but what more should we do? Um, and the potential for the faculty itself to host more subgroups. So there is a bit of an in, a, dentist, a dental and oral health subgroup. There are some kind of, and there were some pre-existing nursing networks. We're actually exploring the possibility of an OT network. I personally think we should have a mental health sub-network because there's so many issues there. So those are, those are the current areas we say around where the faculty will be focusing efforts over the next five years and where we might actually have a bit of resource for the current period we've had very very limited resource so the, the hope is that with a bit of support from crisis we'll be able to do more in this space so i'm going to stop there would welcome how do i stop sharing my screen um would welcome people's kind of input as i said now or i mean open to any questions about both the wider the, the merger discussions and also particularly around the future of the faculty. Crisis are asking us what the faculty is, how it works, who owns it, who controls it. We've been saying, well, it's autonomous and it controls itself. Um, we'll see wh where that gets us. Right, well, thanks very much, Alex. So if we can, if we can carry on as, as we did before with, if people have got questions they want to ask now or, or points they want to make, put them in the chat room and then I'll relay them so we're not all sort of yelling at once. Uh, so, so Stan uh, asked a very pertinent question. Um, the, the, the anxiety is about the pathway hospital teams and, and the sort of the gap between pathway charity and, and the faculty and, and, and what if the only bit of, of what we do at the crisis want is the faculty and the promotion of pathway hospital teams and other parts of the work falls to one side. Is, is, is that a risk and do we have a sort of mitigation policy for that 
think the way we read it is that it's not a risk because genuinely, Stan will know, I think, John Sparks and Matt Downey, they, have, they really like really everything that we do. So they want to keep Pathways brand. They're very keen to explore how they might invest in rolling out more Pathway teams to support that. They want to explore what we could do, perhaps where they have an existing Skylight Centre to kind of to do more around the geographic locations in the country where they're working. And they're really, really interested to kind of, in a way, it's an opportunity for colleagues on the call. They, they're saying they need health expertise and health insights to help them do more. And not just around pathway teams, around better models of primary care. So how can we design better primary care or more into, how, how could we, for example, I think Gina might be on the call. How could we replicate what Bevan have managed to build in Bradford across the country? Um, and, and so that wouldn't be just pathway teams, but also step down outreach, kind of multifaceted primary care, um, all the other things that some of us might have ambitions for. So they're kind of saying to us, you're the experts, tell us, tell us, tell crisis what we think are the most important things to change how the NHS responds to homelessness and kind of adults with multiple complex needs. So I, I don't think there's a danger of them cherry picking. There might be a slight danger in some areas of them slightly going, what, we don't understand why you're doing that activity. Um, the, the bigger nervousness, I think, around the faculty is some slight nervousness around control in that perhaps the faculty is, quote, could some, at some point be out of control. And what if the faculty suddenly started saying things which, which were against a campaign crisis were running around everybody in or something. But even that, I think we should be able to manage. Yeah, and one of the, one of the joys of the faculty is, is, is that it's sort of kind of smoke and mirrors operation, isn't it? That, that we, we've all collectively got together over the last 10 years, called ourselves a thing and started, you know, publishing papers and standards and all that kind of stuff without any real kind of official presence um and of course we couldn't have done that without the support of pathway the charity and uh, it's, it's a sort of symbiotic relationship um but there is more we could do if we had capacity and that's coming out in the on the chat side so uh, uh, olivia butter was saying uh Royal college of psychiatrists would be interested in, in a shared group and, and we've been thinking looking ahead to our march conference about all of these new mental health and homelessness teams that are, that are popping up um and we've got within the faculty um people with huge experience in, in this area like like you know phil timms who set up the start team in south london and uh, uh, jenny drive who's running it now and, and and many other people from from the other um specialist mental health existing specialist mental health team so it'd be a great opportunity to get those people together uh, and similarly in uh, in 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 primary care um but it's all it's a lot of this stuff is about capacities so, so what's happened so far has tended to be where there's been people with particular enthusiasms or or, or, or bits of time that they've, that they've 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 pursued things um alex has shared in the uh, in the chat um uh there the call for papers and, and that is a useful reminder that the um you've got until the 6th of november to put in any offers of papers presentations uh films videos poetry, song, dance, anything that you want to, to bring virtually to the faculty conference in, in March that, that may be of, of interest to, uh, uh, to other members of the, of the, of the faculty. Um, there's a couple of, there was, there's two or three slightly related things. So um, there's, there's the, what about governance of, of the faculty? So, 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 far, so far it's been it's kind of poodled along on, on its own. And then specific issues about, for example, trauma trauma informed care how do we ensure that uh if we have a mental health group it's not taken over by the psychiatrists and we we, we make sure that the psychologists uh, have, have have significant uh, have significant input and what about whether we more or less london centric that's a really good question me here in uh, me here in, in 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 leicester i know we've got people in edinburgh from and, and all over and that's always a concern that um that we look too much like a, a london based thing so to, 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 to summarize uh how do we keep it multidisciplinary and, and and not the powerful doctors running everything what do we think about governance and how do we overcome the perception that this is all about london 
I think to deal with the, the multidisciplinary one first, I think in a way that's just up to us, isn't it? Speaking, speaking as a non-clinician, I don't have loyalty to any of these tribes. And I think we, um, in the standards we've written in that multi-professional interdisciplinary working is what works best for our patients. And that's got to define the kind of core value of the faculty. So if we were doing a mental health network, which was not multidisciplinary, it would be contrary to our values in a way. We shouldn't, we just shouldn't do it. Um, we've got to, of course, it may get a bit more complicated than that. And to some extent, one of our successes has sometimes been to play the politics. So we may sometimes think it's judicious, as someone else has said in the chat, to partner with the Royal of Psychiatrists. But it reminds me of way back when, when Aidan started, he had some conversation with the Royal College of Physicians who said that they weren't terribly interested in what we were doing um, because why would they, the Royal College of Physicians, be interested in homeless people? Um, so we decided to do it anyway. And later on, a different, different president and a complete change of culture at the RCP, I would say, but um, we would still hold that ability to stand a bit outside, I think, and to say, well, this is our own thing. And, and we'd, we'd want within our mental health network to have people with lived experience as well as psychologists and psychiatrists and psychotherapists. So unless it has that rather unique mixture, it's just not doing our thing according to our values. So we wouldn't do it, I hope. Um, in terms of the, the London question is a really good one. And I, I hope that actually this will really help us do more because crises are nationally present, as it were. So they have skylight centres in, I, don't, I haven't got the list in front of me, Newcastle, Liverpool. Um, they're very, very active in Scotland, very, very active in Wales. So I think there's a real opportunity for us to kind of, to coattail on some of their physical presence in places to get our kind of activity going elsewhere physically. Um, so I think that's, I think there's a real positive there to say this is about even more than we have done being thinking about national issues and thinking about how it plays across the country. And again, some of the things we're concerned with do play rather differently in different places. So the whole COVID response has been around homelessness, a bit different in smaller places in rural areas than it is in the big cities. So there, there are challenges there, but I think that should be a real positive. In terms of governance of the faculty, that's a really, really good question, which we've grappled with ever since we set it up. And again, I think, I think crisis will take our lead, will probably do what we tell them we want to do. There is a, a real complexity, and Nigel and I again have had the privilege of having periodic meetings with the, the current and the former president of the Royal College of Physicians, not the one who told Aidan he could start off, but the later ones, um, who've said, kind of broadly we are in a loose way under their umbrella and they've said to us you're fine you're going on fine it's not broken so you don't need to worry about it for the moment when you reach a certain point of maturity and we can when it is come back and talk to us say the rcp because they have i didn't know this but Effectively, the Royal College of Physicians spawned all the other medical royal colleges apart from the surgeons um, over, the over time. And they've said, look, we've been going for 500 years. It may take you 10 or 20 or 30 years to sort yourselves out and to work out precisely what you want to be. Keep in relation to us and we'll give you advice about governance as you go along. So it's not, not really a direct answer to governance. I think, again, it's resources. If we had a bit more resource, then maybe we should have a committee or something like that which is a bit of a governing group. But it's in the end, I think the, the gold dust of the fact is to make sure that it's, the, it's you, people, who are running it. And, some, and as soon as you begin to get bureaucratic, there's a risk that you have elections and post holders and maybe that loses it. But, but, I, but I think we would want to make sure that it's doing what people feel is that it's, it's focused in the right areas. So that governance question is something I guess I'm, I'm waffling. I'm not really answering it, but it's completely open and we want people to engage with the faculty in a, in a way to help us shape what, what I'd almost turn it back, what do people think is the most effective way to govern a kind of open access, flat structured network? How should we do it? So thank you. We're, 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 we're just on six o'clock, so we, we really want to be moving towards wrapping up. There's the last couple of questions which, which perhaps I can re respond to. So 
um, you know, one is, 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 there an, is, is there a way in which the faculty could continue to be entirely um, independent and why the crisis need a controlling interest? So I, I think the answer to that question is, I mean, that is a six million dollar question that he who pays a piper calls, calls a tune and, and why would crisis put significant funding over a number of years into us without they would have to justify that to their trustees and they would have to have a degree of, of control of how the money was spent. But I think our aspiration is to um, keep the faculty at one remove as it, as it is at the moment from, from pathway charity because the thing that everybody most values about us is our clinical independence. So if it's ever, if ever it's perceived that we are um, somebody else's tool, then, then I, I think the, the power of our, of our collective voice will be will be lost. So we do we do understand that, and that is something that we're we're, we're looking to, um, uh, to 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 develop. Uh, final question about um, uh, other other clinical students very keen to involve physios, OTs, allied medical professionals, and and, and keep everybody uh, involved in, in developing this work. So it's lovely to see so many familiar faces. Uh, really sorry that we can't be finishing up the coffee at the back of the room or possibly going um, around the corner to the pub to continue the conversations over a, over a beverage. Um, do look out for the, um, and, and think about putting something in uh, for, the, for the faculty conference um, in March and, and we will have other, other meetings before then. And if anything, if you've got anything that you want to, to, to add to this discussion following on, um, you can either uh, email me, Nigel Hewitt at nhs.net, in replying to your faculty message. If you're not already a member of the faculty, do please join us. Go to pathway.org.uk and click on the faculty join tab and, and join us there. Uh, and if any of those connections don't work, uh, look up, to, uh, you can use info at uh, pathway.org.uk, which is always a good way of, of, of contacting us. So thank you all very much for coming and particular thanks to, to Amina for a very well presented piece of research. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>